there's a persistent legend that someone somewhere has had sex in space. If there were bars of gold on the surface of the moon, it would not be worth it to go get them. Go back 200 years, aluminum is really valuable. The tip of the Washington Monument to this day is aluminum because that used to be fancy, right? But then industrial processes made it cheap. And that's great. Like airplanes use aluminum. I'm the, the microphone I'm talking to, I'm sure uses aluminum. Aluminum is awesome. But it doesn't mean like I have like aluminum foil in my kitchen. It doesn't make me rich. It makes my life better, but it, it doesn't end poverty. Like people will sometimes claim for asteroids. Any idea that in the anywhere in the near term space is going to save us from any calamity is absurd. It's just too hard, too expensive. And also just the general idea that we're going to be launching like millions, billions of tons of stuff to space requiring hundreds of thousands of skyscraper sized rocket launches every day. And that's going to improve the environment is just absurd. All this stuff that makes sense until you start getting finicky about how it's actually going to work when an actual person has to actually go do the thing. Zach, thanks for doing the show. This topic is quite interesting and it's it's all the rage, right? You get Elon saying we're gonna colonize Mars. He's like, I'm gonna die on Mars. Uh, still time for that, I suppose, but probably not in the way that he thinks in a, in a thriving metropolis of the city of a city on Mars, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I, this is a terrible way to begin an interview, but I'm it, now your, your last name is Wiener Smith, which <laughs> it's Wiener, Wiener. Wiener. Oh, it's not even like, OK, because if you look at the German, no. it would be Weiner Smith. <laughs> that would be nice. Right. I would have, you know, if that would be nice. That was kind of where I was going with this. I'm just thinking like, <laughs> man, you know, first grade bullies seldom split that hair. Between, well, it's actually, if you go by the German, it's Weinersmith. So we shouldn't shove him in a locker right now. No, well, you know, it's it's almost, no, it was almost better. Well, no, so my my birth, my maiden name is Wiener. My, my Kelly's last name was Smith. And we we thought this was funny. Uh, and my, my nine-year-old is just realizing that it's funny. And it, it's still funny for her now. I'll be, what happens in, in three years is going to be interesting. Okay, so I was one because I was thinking it doesn't even make sense, right? Because Vienna just means somebody who's from Vienna, essentially, right? But then Smith is what it sounds like, like a blacksmith or somebody who smiths something. So I'm like, who's smithing people from Vienna? It doesn't <laughs> sound like a real, but then I looked at my own name and I was like, nobody, there's no sense to any of this crap anymore anyway. <laughs> you're, you're not a harbinger or anything? Yeah, like, I mean, maybe, but also like <laughs> you really have to stretch the, the definition out in order to make the shoe fit. So I don't know. Yeah, I just, I just remember reading this and I was like, of course these guys are space geeks because, you know, <laughs> how far away from these boys could I get? Mars sounds good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's, you know, the old joke is that the reason astronauts all come from Ohio is they're trying to get as far away as possible. <laughs> from Ohio. That actually makes a yes. lot of sense. As a guy from Michigan, I get it. Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> let's let's talk about colonizing Mars slash space in the first place. Because, again, it's an exciting prospect. But I know you're going to rain on our parade, which is fine. I think a reality check every now and then is probably a good idea, especially because... And look, no shade on Elon. The dude's done some amazing stuff from SpaceX to Tesla. And I was an early-ish investor in Tesla. And that turned out really great. And so, look, no shade on the guy. He's done some amazing stuff. But also, there's also stuff where it's like, I'm, I paid for a self-driving car. And I'll be damned. I drove that thing myself the last, well, forever. I've never had it drive me anywhere. Some of that is because I'm scared. And some of it is because it doesn't work that well. Right? And And... The Mars thing seems like another, hey, we're going to do this. It's going to be within 50 years. And then in 200 years, we're going to be like, so we thought it was going to be 50 years. But now we're saying within 30 years, we're definitely going to start doing that. And it's going to be like, wait a minute. This is my great grandfather wrote about this as a thing that almost seemed like it was happening now. And we're just building launch vehicles. You know, that's that's kind of how this looks to me now after reading your book, especially. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me let me give you the positive case before I come in with the bummer. Uh, so the <clears throat> the positive case would be essentially that the launch technology really has been revolutionized. I think there there are some people who, because Elon Musk is kind of a jerk, especially when he gets on uh, his personal social media network, want to make it out that he's just a grifter all the way down. But SpaceX has been genuinely revolutionary new technology. It's it's a it's an idea that's been around since the early days of space, which is reusable rockets. And they actually got it done before, like every space agency in the mm -hmm. world. Um, 
and they actually dropped the prices. You can actually look at the prices they uh, of like space launch going back to the 40s. They dropped drastically in the early space age, and then they just absolutely hit a plateau. They arguably get even more expensive. Like so, like you know how everyone was miserable about space from like 1980 to 2015. Like all, all the dreams died. That's why the price stayed high, but it started collapsing. <clears throat> And that's mostly down to SpaceX. So that's like, that's the case for optimism. Like, we really are going to be able to do a lot more in space. So it is getting cheaper and cheaper to launch things into space. That's great. And I know there was that plateau for a while. Can you give us an idea of how the cost of putting things into space has dropped over the years? You know what? It, it, maybe yeah. you can choose like a household item, you know, to, to mail or mail to send this mug to space would have been like 10 grand in, in 1968. And now it's like $4. I don't know. Why does that look? That that's actually not too far off. The number we used to always give like 10 years ago was $10,000 a pound, which like one way to say it would be an apple seed would cost about $10 to send to space. Wow. Right. So it's z zany expensive. Uh, under SpaceX, I mean, you know, without getting into the weeds, because it can be very hard to make comparisons between depending on what you're doing. But like now it's more like like a um, thousand to three thousand per per pound, something in that range, depending on what you're doing. Okay, right? so, so it's like genuinely a change, right? It's dropped seventy to ninety percent, which is yeah. that's really amazing. And but it seems like we need it to get to ninety nine point nine percent cheaper before it's like, yeah, let's send a skyscraper up with rockets attached to it or whatever the plan is. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think that's probably right. You need it to keep getting cheaper. Um, but but I will say, you know, it's worth noting the cheapness opens up other stuff. So if you look at like uh, the James Webb telescope, part of why those things are so expensive is they have to be crammed. Every last bit of mass is precious in these fairings. Mm -hmm. So you get to a world where you have much bigger ships that are much cheaper. You can do a lot more off the shelf stuff. Uh, you can you can like waste more space. I see. You know, you. Yeah, so, so there is a whole economy. I'm trying. This is the optimistic side of this. This is why people are really geeked out. Is yeah, because there genuinely is a change happening. Th this makes sense, though. So for for because that almost went over my head. So I'm gonna assume that some people maybe didn't pick up on that. So it, right now you've got to pack this massive satellite, a delivery vehicle, and all the tech and all the solar panels that unfurl and whatever into the smallest possible package that's the lightest possible to launch it. So you're using all these, well, space age materials, super expensive stuff. Hey, we need a custom XYZ widget that fits into exactly. this tiny little space and this weird thing because this is all we have left. And they're like, great, we'll make it for $10 million. But once it gets, it, it gets cheap enough, it's like, no, we're just going to buy a bunch of like space proof Apple Mac studio computers and shove them in a rack yep. and then launch those. And that's like, Oh, hey, that's a hey, yeah. million dollars instead of a million dollars for the piece that holds the thing together. Yeah, e exactly. And in addition, you know, you know, you take Starlink, for example, you could estimate roughly speaking of this new giant rocket SpaceX is working on called Starship works. You could launch something like say three or 400 mini sats per launch. So you're now also getting, you know, economies of scale, uh, so, so, so it really is. I don't want to take anything away from this aspect of it. This is like amazing stuff that's happening that is really world changing. Yeah, that that part. I want to keep it optimistic, right? Because even though we're going to poke holes in the the balloon slash rain on the parade, whatever metaphor we want to use, I don't want people to be like, oh, we're never going to space because never is a long time, and it's frankly almost. One thing that I will say, Elon and all the other sp pro space folks have done is, if you'd ask me like. 20 years ago, if we were ever going to colonize space, I would be like, absolutely not. Definitely nothing in my lifetime. And I don't mean a city on Mars. I mean, like anybody. I'd be like, no, it's just science fiction. Now I'm thinking, OK, we just maybe a pause in global hostilities would be great and some resource dedication to this. But it's not impossible. There's there's just ways to do this that didn't exist and certainly were not in my mind a couple of decades ago. And that that's more important. I think then people realize is once you get people to believe that something is possible in large numbers, people who are talented start going into those fields for when they're kids yep. and they start studying this stuff. And then you get this critical mass of people that are like, we can do this. And that's how stuff like this gets done, period, I would imagine. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I really think, you know, part of why space settlement is, is, a, is a thing that's talked about a lot is it's very inspiring. And it helps to get a lot of young, talented engineers to want to come to work at a place like SpaceX, even though the like work hours are notoriously brutal uh, and difficult. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple of ex-SpaceX friends and they're like, you don't understand. 
like I work at Apple now. It's way more chill. And if you know anybody who works at Apple, they're like, what are you talking about? Apple is not chill at all. But SpaceX is something else. So if the bottleneck isn't cost, it's what is it? It's something else. What is it? Yeah, I would say it's a variety of of things. Uh, So I'll give you an example of one that to us is very important, which is we know almost nothing about whether humans can reproduce in space. We actually, strictly speaking, don't even know if humans can mate in space, though. I'd, I'd say it's almost certainly yes. Uh, but but conception, uh, development, everything you have to do to have a civilization, right? Not just like an outpost, like an Antarctic base type of thing. Okay. We don't know how to do that. The, the science, like there, there's a tiny amount of science that's been done on space stations. It's totally unsystematic. It's like we have one thing with six rats over here and a thing done on quail eggs over here and some like, uh, you know, livestock sperm was sent to space over there. But we don't have a kind of like program to answer this question. Right. I'm imagining recruiting a space program and they're like, what are we going to be doing? And they're like, you guys are going to be banging a lot <laughs> and filming it and sending it and to all of us it. for analysis. It's like, I don't know how you, many people are signing up for that. They're, they're, you know, I was never able to track it down, but there's a persistent story, which is probably not true, but in, in the waning days of the last Soviet space station, when they sort of lurched into hyper-capitalism, there was a proposal to shoot a pornographic film on, on space station <laughs> oh, Mir. Um, but I, there, there are legends that, that uh, crop up all over the place uh, with, with this stuff. But, but no, so, so yeah, there's a persistent legend that someone somewhere has had sex in space. And uh, I actually, we disagree about this. Kelly thinks it's probably happened. I think it probably hasn't. Uh, but it's, you know, one of those questions for the ages, I guess. It's, but is the whole thing is that it's not like there's private, there's got to be almost no area of that whole thing that's not monitored. That's right. So if they're watching you do all this other stuff, I guess if you can really get over the fact that somebody's watching you live at 24 7, it's, it, I don't know. It seems a little unlikely, but, but who do, what do I know? What do I know? All right. <laughs> let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, I know one of the bottlenecks is the creating a biosphere. And tell me, well, first of all, what is a biosphere and what is the problem here? Because we've made biospheres on Earth, right? The biosphere, too. I remember that. I remember the crappy Polly Shore movie of the yeah. same name. Um, but w- w- why is this so difficult? What are we missing from that? Yeah, yeah. So so to explain what, what it is and why you would want it. So a, a biosphere, uh, also called a closed-loop ecology, but the basic idea is you have a sort of sealed bubble And inside it, you put plant, animal, bacteria life, and it's just self-sustaining. It doesn't turn into like goo, right? It doesn't die off. uh, It doesn't get out of control in some way. It just exists Um, and does all the stuff that Earth does for you, right? You generate oxygen. The plants uh, generate, um, absorb carbon dioxide, and you have these these loops, these ecological loops. Um, The reason you want that in space is because space is awful everywhere without exception, uh, the moon is just terrible. There's obviously no air, but also the, like the ground is trying to kill you. Um, the, the soil can't make plants. Mars is similar. It has other problems. And so really what we're talking about, we're talking about putting a, a, a city on Mars, any kind of habitat on Mars, is that you have to have one of these ecologies inside it, like a self-contained fake ecosystem that is not directly interacting with the outside world, right? A- a- except in the sense of maybe absorbing like mass in that like like dirt from Mars could say with a lot of work be ameliorated to be brought into the system, right? But mostly you're trying to not have a strong interaction other than to get sunlight. So can we do this? <clears throat> it's been a question that's been around since the 60s. The Soviets did some work on it um, that was kind of inconclusive. Uh, and then there's been a few experiments here and there. And the biggest one by far is the one you mentioned called Biosphere 2, And by the way, there was no Biosphere 1. Biosphere 1 is Earth. They were being a little cheeky about it. Oh, I wondered about that. I'm like, we never hear about the first one. It must have have just been a short-lived project. Whoops. Okay, that explains it. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. They they did have prototypes, but the thing that, so it was run by this kind of crazy guy. He's still alive, I think. His name's John Allen. It's kind of like a a Steve Jobs before you could be Steve Jobs, like a guy who talks in tech speak about kind of crazy stuff, but also does big projects. And so hence, like the kind of artsy quality to the project. But essentially what it was is you had the facility that was about the size of three football fields and it was sealed uh, and eight humans went in and they survived for two years. And in that sense, it was quite successful. Uh, the, the downside is at one point, 
uh, they were suffocating. They were, the system was absorbing oxygen out and they didn't know that. They couldn't figure out where the oxygen was going. It's a really weird thing to have in a sealed system Ooh. for oxygen just to disappear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it just turns out the structure was absorbing it like chemically. Um, wow. At another point, they also, they were like starving. They, they lost, I think, 10 to 18% of body weight and they weren't like chubby people. You can look at pictures like they're just running out of food. They weren't making it fast enough. And there, there were other problems I get into. Um, they also were fighting, by the way. They didn't speak for like a year. There were two factions of four that hated each other. Oh my God. Um, the, yeah, there's a story at one point that got so bad, two people for one side came and spit on a woman. I think it was two people at separate times the same day. It was like a coordinated Coordinated strike. spitting. This is like a Seinfeld episode <laughs> or something. No, Only with totally. scientists who should know better. But I guess if you're starving and possibly suffocating and you've been with the same people for two years and you weren't sure how, yeah. I can, I can, I'm not a guy you want to put in a biosphere. Let me put it that way. No. Definitely not. Yeah, 100%. I wouldn't want to do it either. Um, but so I, I would say that you could at least say it was a qualified success and it could have been, you know, there could have been more going on. They only did one other run that got called off short because there was like financial mismanagement in fighting. And, uh, as a fun fact, by the way, that one of the guys who helped get it back or take over and finish the project off was Steve Bannon. Uh, it's like an early Wait, Steve, episode this, of the life the of Steve Bannon that we're currently seeing with the, the <laughs> that guy, that one. Yeah. Okay. That guy, he was, I, that's, there, there is no more to that fun fact. It's just one of the weirdest little <laughs> Steve Bannon suddenly pops into my space science story. Uh, you're like, this has to be a different Steve Bannon, right? Let's Google it. I did look. I did I'm check. I'm sure yeah, you no, did it's, because it's... otherwise you're like, wait a minute. I mean, I'm still <laughs> mentally double taking from that. That seems so off brand. It's, it's well, okay, but it was, it was in, in the context of being part of a financial firm. Uh, so it's, okay, it's, I see. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Sheesh. Um, All right. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so so that basically called off. We have some data from it. The people who worked on it still work on some of this stuff. And But since then, there's just been small scale experiments like in Europe and Japan and China. And that's it. So the max scale we have is eight people, right? So if you're talking about a million people on Mars uh, who need to be supplied by a system like this, if it scales, if it's like the same size, right? Eight people need three acres, then you're talking about, you know, a, a, a greenhouse the size of Singapore, to sustain this civilization on Mars. So the scale is insane. Yeah, um, wow. Yeah. And that's like, if everything goes right, because it sounds like right. if they were running out of food, it, I mean, there's just a lot that can go wrong. You don't wanna be like, we have exactly enough food, not a pound more for the right, the right number of people. It's just like, that's, no, you want a nice little buffer there for when- Yeah, well, I, I, 100%. And so, so for example, on, on day one, I believe, of Biosphere, one of the women in the program, I think it was Jane Pointer, cut off the tip of her finger in a threshing machine. And when you're not on Mars, you can actually, they let her leave the sim and go to a hospital because uh, there was no hospital in the building. There was, you know, first aid. And they, like, put her fingertip back on. Um, there, there was other stuff, too. Like, they were just drawing power off the grid. Uh, they didn't have to build their own greenhouse like you would on Mars, you know, so there's stuff like that. Of course, there might be benefits to scale. It might be easier to run the system if it's much larger. We just don't know. And that's that, that's the big problem here is, is we don't know. And getting an answer to a question like that, like how does an ecosystem evolve over time at different scales, uh, is, is a really tricky scientific problem that'll take a long time to get. And nobody is spending much money on it. Yeah, that's, that is quite interesting. There's a lot of other little problems too that I, I took some very choice notes. This is a very difficult endeavor. And I, I heard you say, and I love this by the way, going to Mars because the earth is messed up would be like leaving a messy bedroom to go live in a toxic waste dump. That's how <laughs> incompatible Mars, for example, is with human life compared to earth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's really important to hit on this because I think people watch movies and you get the idea that Mars is kind of like, okay, it's like not great, uh, but it's kind of like Arizona minus air or something, right? But it turns out there's just lots of stuff you can't see in those movies or that doesn't get portrayed. Uh, and so like, for example, about 1% of Martian soil is, is a chemical that messes up hormones. And so we don't know what long-term exposure hmm. to it does to adults. Uh, but what's really scary is you want to talk about reproduction, like what's that going to do to a developing child? Is, highly unclear you'll right. obviously want to not have it but that's going to be a huge amount of work and 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 one thing we know one of the most important findings from biosphere from the experiments by the soviets and other ones is that the people in these systems spend all their time just surviving right they spend like huge i think i think in biosphere it was like six hour or i'm sorry six days a week we're spent running the farm just to have enough to eat while starving uh, and and to drink and all that. And so, you know, you, if you're going to also have to be cleansing the soil and, you know, running your own power plant, you get in, in excess of 24 hours very quickly. 
Um, th there's other bad stuff about Mars, too. I mean, so there are worldwide dust storms from time to time. Uh, that's despite the atmosphere being quite thin. So you, you still die if you go outside without a pressure suit. Um, but but there's enough atmosphere to whip up dust storms that, hmm. that blot out the sun, which is really bad for solar panels, oh, yeah. presumably. Uh, it's going to be embarrassing. Uh, so <laughs> Yeah, embarrassing. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I would say so. Yeah, the per, if the perchlorates <laughs> in the soil don't destroy your thyroid and make you stop growing when you're four years old, <laughs> the lack of solar energy for days on end or weeks or however long those storms last, that could be a problem. Yeah. I can see that being a problem. W where do we get energy then? Because if solar panels are sort of on off, and, and by the way, is Mars too far for solar panels that we have now to generate an appropriate amount of electricity? That, that's a really good question. So it, it, it is not, but it is pretty far, right? So I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe it's, you get something like half as much solar power per panel on the surface of Mars. It, it's a little complicated because you're farther out, but the atmosphere is thinner and blah, blah, right. blah. But the problem is, so theoretically that could be okay. And also because Mars has days that are weirdly Earth-like, they're about 24 hours, hmm. I think 24.7. So you'd, you'd have a day-night cycle uh, and you would have light. But when you can expect regularly to lose your solar power for weeks at a time, it's like you either have to have an insanely good battery system or you need some other regular power source, right? And so fossil fuels are out. There are no fossils on Mars unless there's a big surprise uh, awaiting us. Um, so you got the, you know, you could, you can't really do wind. There have been some zany proposals, but because the atmosphere is so thin, I think they'd have to be just these gigantic, mega huge structures. You could maybe, you know, tap underground heat yeah. like we do on geothermal. Earth called geo geothermal yeah so th that is apparently literally possible on 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 mars but it's thought to be quite difficult i mean geothermal you, you try to imagine setting up a geothermal system where there's no air and you're in these like wastes outside yeah um you'd have to the, the, be able to yeah. drill to towards the core of a planet <laughs> without yeah w with while also basically being in space at the same time Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's like literally possible, you know, but you're, you know, so, so usually we say that the best option until like some sci-fi stuff happens is you have a good old fashioned nuclear reactor. You, you ship up some uranium or plutonium, you run your reactor. And for all the downsides to that, that some of your audience is imagining, it is a kind of like power source in a box that works night or day. Um, you know, it's, it, as one of the upsides, you're already kind of going to be bathed in radiation. Yeah, at least of your concerns. Uh, I was going to say the radiation <laughs> thing, like at this point, it, it's like a smoker being like, I think the jackhammering outside is hurt that bad for my health. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, probably what you do is you go out some distance from your habitat, you dig a hole and you put it in there. Um, you know, the, uh, you, you'll still have to have like people to operate it and stuff. But when you compare that to having to like clean like acres and acres and acres of solar panels in like doom, it just uh, it, it's just probably the best option until some some sort of, you know, crazy sci fi tech comes along. I, I like to I'd like to highlight your earlier point, which is colonizing Mars is not a solution for a messed up Earth. And I, I like this for a few reasons. One. I think a lot of people are like, ah, climate change, can't do anything about that. Plastics in the ocean, can't do anything about that. Uh, litter and garbage and lack of recycling and big oil and all this other, can't do anything about that. We're, it's fine, we're gonna go to Mars. And it's like, again, you're leaving a messy bedroom for a toxic waste dump. You're, it's not, this is not just like the, oh good, we get a second crack at things. It's not really like that. Not, not at all. Uh, I mean, you, you we, we joke, like if you, if you had Earth, we actually looked up what is the worst case climate change scenario anyone's predicting. Take that and like add nuclear war and any other catastrophe you like, like, I don't know, like there's a hole in the earth and demons are pouring out. <laughs> that's still that's still a planet where you can breathe uh, and where they like gravity. You know, there aren't they have gravity. Gravity's nice. We haven't even gotten into that. Gra you know, the lack of gravity probably has all sorts of bad long term effects we don't even know about. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, the, any idea that in the anywhere in the near term space is going to save us from any calamity is absurd. It's just too hard, too expensive. And also just the general idea that we're going to be launching like millions, billions of tons of stuff to space requiring hundreds of thousands of skyscraper sized rocket launches every day. And that's going to improve the environment is just absurd. Yeah, um, it's, it's 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 unlikely. Let's say I, you know, I'm sure there's there's some space nerd who's angry at me right now. Well, but, the yeah. the name of the basically the sub name of this show, the subtext of the show is pissing off bunches of listeners for things you'd never imagine. <laughs> 
Like, <laughs> I get it. When I do an episode where somebody's like, hey, plastics in the ocean aren't as big of a problem as we thought, you shouldn't let this guy say his thing. I get why people are angry about that. I understand why yeah. when somebody says Hamas is not a terrorist organization, people are angry about that. I'm angry about that. But the thing that's going to trigger someone in this episode is going to be something that you and I both think is completely <laughs> benign. That's how this works. Yes. That's how this works. Yeah. So don't even try to I, not piss people off. It's not worth it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think what I found is 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 all ideas about going to space are kind of bound up with utopianism. Like whatever you think is wrong with Earth will be better over there because you can get a clean break with your people uh, and and fix it all. And it's just like, you know, we, we, there, there are all sorts of different scenarios and they just don't hold up because humans are just going to be people over there only like surrounded by poison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, <laughs> surrounded by other people, that which is what yes. happened in Biosphere 2, which seems like it was a big problem. And in fact, I know you've said that space settlements might actually favor autocratic authoritarian governments. That is a really interesting point that makes perfect sense to me, because it's probably going to have to start off basically like a military outpost just because the stakes are so high, you can't have people being like, I got freedom of poking holes in the wall if I want to. You can't do that. You have to have people that are all rowing in the same direction if you're going to survive in space. But, and this is nerdy, but it reminds me of, there's a Call of Duty, which is a video game. There's an installment where the Mars Settlement Defense Force essentially attacks the Earth because they're like, hey, we don't need these guys anymore. We have our own planet. We got our own thing going. It's a totalitarian military regime along the lines of, I guess, maybe Sparta or whatever. I'm I'm a little less worried about Mars settlement defense force attacking us. I, that scenario is a little out of mind. But I think you might be right about autocracy in a place like Mars or, or in space anywhere, at least for the first few slash several generations of humans there, because it, it's just, how else are you going to function? How else are you going to create a society like that? And it's tough growing up in an environment like that. Ask anybody who defected from North Korea, for example. And it, it's going to be tough <laughs> to transition to what might look like a functioning democracy from authoritarianism, because those values have to be there somewhere behind the scenes. And I'm not sure how you do that unless you have really good contact with earth the whole time. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think that there's a good case for that. There's a, a scholar named Charles Kakel who writes a lot about this, about like, as an example, you know, if you're living in a built structure on Mars, there is some source of oxygen under somebody's control in a way that's just not true on Earth, right? No matter, like, the worst company town you can imagine, like, your boss didn't have control over oxygen. Um, the, the closest analog sometimes uses submarines, and we actually did. We read some submarine books, and we found a case of a guy who at least claimed he tuned the oxygen up or down to, like, adjust mood in the submarine. Uh, so, like, apparently people are capable of this huh. sort of thing. I mean, you hear it from and, casinos, yeah. and it's not true, uh, apparently, the whole... Yeah. But yeah. but I, I can I, see that. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, he who controls the spice controls the universe. That's a soundbite I should have gotten for this show. But it's <laughs> somebody... Who, if you want to put down a rebellion in one corner of your space settlement, all you have to do is be like, well, I'm turning the air off if you guys don't calm down. I mean, that'll do it. Yeah, yeah, you could even, I mean, you know, if you want to get really nasty, all you have to do is crank the CO2 level up to about one, one and a half percent. People start get headaches. And uh, and so you can you can give them carbon uh, narcosis oh, and yeah. just make them chill. Yeah. So, so yeah, I know it is a problem. And then that's the question is like, you know, it's one thing if, if a bunch of people want to voluntarily go live this lifestyle by all means. But, but if they decide they want to have children, then it seems to me to be like an ethical nightmare uh, that should probably be stopped. Uh, uh, I mean, this, this is something we get into because sometimes we'll, we'll talk about like, well, we have concerns about like ethical things. And so we'll say, well, you're just a bunch of ninnies uh, and me and Elon are going to Mars and you can't stop us and you shouldn't be able to stop us. And, and to which I say, like, if you just want to personally go and hurt yourself, that's awesome. Have an adventure. I would like to watch the movie. Uh, I, I like I like reading about like Arctic explorers. They're kind of crazy, but awesome. But if you're talking about like having children or setting up some kind of rival state structure or, or you know, these sorts of things, then there's a conversation to be had about what, what like the, right, the rights of other people on Earth are. Can current construction gear even function on Mars temperatures? Because I look at construction sites around here and I'm, I grew up in Michigan. I live in California now. And I, I just thought, wow, these guys out here, they have it much, much easier than they did in Michigan. They got to go in the winter. And, and then I thought to myself, OK, the winter. Now, imagine that's way colder. There's no air. And you'd have to modify the engine, right? You can't run a diesel engine on Mars with no atmosphere, oxygen, whatever I would imagine. But even then... 
What about the treads on a bulldozer? What about a crane? Don't those require certain amounts of gravity to stay put and other, you have to redesign all this stuff, not to mention just temperature stuff, temperature issues. Yeah, so this sort of thing is really important. Uh, one of my favorite cranky rants by an astro guy was he was talking about there are these proposals for melting some of the water on the moon to for all sorts of uses. And he was talking, complaining about a proposal that said, you know, we'll use all this water and here's how we're going to recycle it and all this stuff. It did not mention that part of getting it involved something like an eight mile traverse through the darkness in like whatever it was, negative 200 Fahrenheit uh, on the surface of the moon, which, of course, has no air, among other problems. And there's, I think, a, a kind of like tendency for people who've never had to do this sort of work to think we can just run some numbers. Uh, but a, as an example, we talked to a guy who had worked on lunar rovers and he said a really hard problem is just making a, a lubricant that can survive you know, alternating between like 600 degrees of Fahrenheit uh, on a two weeks basis as it does on the moon. And so, yeah, I mean, actually, once you start thinking about this, it gets really crazy. Like if you have something that depends on a heavy weight dropping, well, you have less gravity, right? So you need you need more weight to get the same oomph when it slams into the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you just think about like the pressure. So as an example, you know, in a movie, if your buddy has a problem outside the space station, you throw on the pressure suit and you run out. In real life, if you do that, you will get the bends. You will get nitrogen bubbles in your blood because of the pressure change and you will just die. Um, you actually have to go into an airlock and there are different ways for doing this, but something like say a half hour to an hour has to be spent breathing pure oxygen to get the nitrogen out of your system. So it's like, there's all this stuff that makes sense until you start getting finicky about how it's actually going to work when an actual person has to actually go do the thing. <laughs> that's yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Tell me about this moon thing. 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Does the moon change 600 degrees every two weeks? What is, I had no idea. Yeah, so the moon, on, on the moon, a, a day is two Earth, I'm sorry, two Earth weeks long, right? So so meaning like you get 14 days of light, 14 days of darkness. And so, uh, and also no no atmosphere, which would kind of spread out the ambient temperature, right? You're just blasted see. or not. And so, uh, yeah, so temperatures tend to get really, really, really hot, like hot as an oven, and then really, really, really cold, uh, you know, much colder than ice. And so obviously that's havoc for a little rover that needs to survive all these conditions. Also, what we do to get them to survive is you put a little bit of plutonium in there to just keep them toasty. <laughs> uh, and, uh, Wouldn't want that in my and, pocket, though, as a human, I don't think. Well, you know, if you, if you have enough cladding, uh, you know, uh, Maybe. I, I would, yeah, it would depend on, on where you're holding it. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, keep it, keep but, it family uh, friendly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So you get these huge temperature swings, uh, and and it's a real problem for all sorts of reasons. So we go back to like solar power. So you say to yourself, "Well, can we use solar power?" Well, it's going to switch off two weeks at a time. The only exception to that is if you set up up at the poles, right? If you're if the north or south pole, you get grazed by the sun most of the time. There are even a couple tiny areas where like ninety five percent of the time there's light. Um, but but it, it's, it's very unusual. Most of the moon is not that way. Hmm. Yeah, that I had, you know, I just, I just never thought about the temperature on the moon. I guess I just thought it was probably yeah. like a brisk morning in Michigan <laughs> at worst, not yeah. like negative 600 degrees or whatever, negative 400 yeah. degrees slash 400 plus, whatever it is. You know, I, I never thought the moon would actually get hot. That, that for sure is a surprise. Uh, so that yeah. seems miserable, I guess. And, and yes, we're flip-flopping between the moon and Mars, but I guess at this point, what's yeah. the difference? It's mostly just settling space. What about the building materials themselves? You know, my house is largely made out of wood and metal. That's fine when you're talking about maybe zero degrees up to a hundred and let's say 150 in the most extreme, you know, areas. But now we're talking about negative 200 to, or negative 300 to, positive 300, you can't just build something out of wood or metal. It's just going to melt or shatter or, or, or whatever, right? Yeah. So, 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 um, if you're going to do, so there are parts of Mars that are a little more temperate near the equator. Uh, but if you're going to do the moon you're going to have these huge temperature swings, the, the solution is pretty much the same in every mission proposal, which is you need to be under a huge amount of soil. Um, so, so, so there are different ways you could do that. You could set a sort of tin can to the surface and just, you know, using the construction equipment we just said would be really hard, uh, pile, uh, you know, a huge pile of, of, of what's called regolith, this, this messed up soil on the moon 
on top. And what that does is it just kind of protects you from those big temperature swings, kind of like if you were a mole, right? <clears throat> um, a more interesting proposal, which to me is like separate from whether I think it's a good idea is, is maybe the most awesome idea, which is uh, the, the moon isn't really seismically active anymore, but it once was, which meant there used to be flowing lava in places. If you've ever been to Hawaii yeah. or I've totally had these. Yeah, yeah. So you've been like lava tube caves, oh, right? Yeah. Or maybe I, I yeah, those so on those the moon. exist. They have them on the moon, wow. only they're much, much bigger, maybe as much as 100 times bigger. Uh, so, so wow. Some of the most extraordinary you could drive, structures. You could the, yeah. drive any size, well, multiple, you could, 100 times bigger. That's yeah. the, that's like Insane, a right? freeway, more maybe even. Uh, it, it, it's it, To me, it's like if, if you were going to pick a mission for sheer awesomeness just about anywhere in the solar system, sending somebody into one of these would be would be top of my list wow. uh, but but from, from from a settlement perspective the exciting thing would be instead of like landing a tin can and piling stuff on it or else trying to build stuff out of the surface you go into this cave and you have some kind of say spray on sealant and you just seal up the cave or a chunk of the cave and then you pump it full of air and whatever else you need and then you've got a little pocket and now you can just build in there, right? So not everything has to be defended against space. The the cave is doing it for you. Hmm. Uh, so so that's a, a pretty typical that's proposal. Cool. But the real, yeah, it's awesome, right? I mean, you just talk about like, I mean, I, I'm always amazed people have never heard of these, but my understanding is they were only really understood starting about 20 years ago. There's actually not that much, where everybody gets excited about Mars. There's a lot of scientists who are like, why don't we send more stuff to the moon? The moon is amazing. Um, yeah, that's, I, but, I just yeah. had no idea they were so massive too, because- it's just, it's such a, it's so amazing how big that must be. Because those lava, lava tubes in Hawaii, you can walk through those. Like right. Very yeah, they're like cathedrals. Easily, yeah. yeah. So something that's a hundred times bigger, you could fit my neighborhood in there. Yeah. It's really that, something. No, no, yeah. It, it's crazy. You can imagine, uh, you know, whole cities, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the only real downside other than like, you know, uh, uh, it being difficult to get into these things, and there's some questions about structural stability, uh, <laughs> but it's probably it's probably fine. Um, but uh, is just that there aren't many, and so you know oh. where it gets scary is like if the U.S. goes first, uh, and then China says, "Hey, you took the best spot." I don't know. Does it get weird? Um, but but yeah, if you were going to set up a settlement, that would be one of the cooler places to do it. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. Mars has a bunch of CO2 on it. Plants love CO2. Is there a fit here? Can we terraform Mars somehow by putting plants that eat the CO2 or, you know, eat the CO2 and make oxygen? Or is that just going to cause all kinds of other issues? Uh, yes and no. OK, so um, setting aside total terraforming for a second and I'll come back to it. The big upside of CO2 is, as you say, plants will take it in, build themselves and then spit out oxygen, which is just great. Uh, you know, on, on the moon, there is very little carbon in the soil. This is often skipped. So you literally cannot grow plants in it. You can't do it. Uh, on Mars, with that CO2 just floating around for the taking, you can grow plants. Um, they can release oxygen. You do need, and I won't get into the chemistry, but you need a hydrogen source if you want to also get water. But if you have that source, you have water, you have oxygen, you can even make fuel in the form of methane, which is just a flammable gas that you could also use to like fuel up a rocket or make uh, like... Um, fuel for a buggy uh, on the Martian surface. So it's incredibly convenient. Um, in terms of terraforming, meaning turning Mars into at least something like Earth. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think just by having plants, you could do that because the atmosphere is really thin. Um, so even if you cracked all the oxygen out of that CO2, I don't think it'd be nearly enough. Typical proposals call for something like slamming, like redirecting comets into the poles of, of Mars or even like a huge amount of nuclear weapons. And the idea there is just you're, you're going to, the poles have water. And so if you spew so much water into the atmosphere, you'll get a greenhouse effect like we're trying to avoid on Earth, uh, but which would be desirable on, on Mars to some extent. What, what would you, that you do, though? That, I'm confused. If we, we yeah. would smash a, somehow smash a comet or a giant bunch of nukes yeah. into Mars, the frozen water would go in the air and yeah. what would, then then what? Block sun? So, 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 
No, no, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Uh, actually, yeah, oh, yeah, was, yeah. Okay, so now I see what you mean. Right. So yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's just yeah. Go ahead. So so it vaporizes a bunch of water because of the explosion, and then the atmosphere has water in it. But wouldn't that be temporary, or am I just not understanding how these things work? My so uh, this this is getting toward the edge of my expertise. My understanding it was be it would be literally temporary, but it would still be like a million years worth of atmosphere. Oh, I so see. you'd have you'd have a little time to right. work so, it out. So so time know? to figure yeah, buys us some time to figure it out. <laughs> that makes that's actually really kind of cool. Just to think you could do something like that. I guess you have to do that before you put anything else on Mars because it's gonna be like explosion like the the, the the world has never seen uh, to tr try and do that to a planet. I mean, it seems like something else could go wrong. Like, so it worked, but now Mars is on a different orbit and we definitely can't colonize it because it's way further out or something now, or it's the turned weird. I don't know. Um, that seems like a, that's one of those geoengineering things where you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube and then suddenly you realize it was a huge mistake and now you've got to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. And there, there are also there are people, and I, I feel complicated about this, but who would say, you know, we only have one Mars and it's like a record of everything that's ever happened here. And if we if we changed it drastically, we would just lose all this, you know, potential information forever. Yeah, um, that that's a but, yeah. that's a valid argument in many ways, I suppose. I, that said, mm -hmm. the question is, how much do we care about that versus colonizing another planet successfully? I don't know. That's a tough yeah. calculation. I I think it's a really tough question, actually. I mean, so the moon to me is the more interesting example because the moon is a like it's just like a rock. I know that's like a stupid thing to say, but but meaning yeah, how dare you? it has been exposed. How do Yeah. But but like it, everything that has happened to Earth has happened to the moon. Right. It's been there with us for eons and eons and eons. So there are records of what has happened to our planet that are gone from our planet because we have, you know, climate and life and the movement of, of oceans and things. That information is so to speak, embedded in the moon. Yeah, fossilized, and essentially, so, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so you know, some of these proposals for tearing up huge parts of the surface of the moon for, for minerals, um, I don't think they're plausible in general, but but I do think it's worth considering the scientific aspect. Let's talk about mining, because people talk about asteroid mining, and, well, I'm going to get a bunch of, what is it, helium three from the surface of the, I don't, I don't really even know what that is, but tell me about that, the valuable elements of the moon. Why, why is that not a thing that you think is possible? Right. So, um, th there's a couple things going on here. So yeah, we'll, we can talk about moon mining in particular, and then I can try to expand out to the other places. So in order to justify getting something off the moon, it has to be extremely valuable, right? It has, like it has to be a small thing that's quite valuable because it is so expensive to go to the moon. Even with the modern price drops, like there's a lot of other stuff that has to go on. You still need a spacecraft and a lander and trained people, and it's quite dangerous. In 2017, there's a scientist named Michel Van Pelt, and I'll, I'll get this almost verbatim, but he said something like, if there were bars of gold on the surface of the moon, it would not be worth it to go get them. Really? Wow. Um, that's how, well, you think about like, well, anyway, yeah. So there's just not enough like density of value in gold. Maybe if there were like, you know, diamonds, I don't know what it would take. But but the point is there's not, right? So there's been this desire to find some reason to go to the moon other than it just like showing up the Soviets or being generally awesome. And people just haven't come up with that much. I don't think anything that's convincing. You will sometimes hear people say helium three, yeah. which without getting into the details, uh, but it does come up a lot. What is it? Is it? It's, 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 uh, you know, so there's helium, the usual helium, the stuff you get in a balloon yeah. is helium four, helium three, just it's a different amount of neutrons. It's what's called an isotope. It's just a different form of the same element, but it has certain qualities that make it useful. One, it has medical applications. It's just useful for some screenings we do, but, but the usual thing people say is that you could use it for a certain type of fusion drive. And I can get very nerdy about this, but I will just say, it's sort of like, we already can't do it easier version of, of fusion uh, that's in a lower temperature so like scaling up to helium-3 fusion plus adding in that you have to get it from the moon is like it's like showing off or something it's like doing fusion like while doing a backflip like <laughs> we why are we doing this and so um you know we if you want to get really nerdy there's a paper we talk about in the book but the basic deal is like it's it's for a spacey thing we probably won't build and don't need to build and anyway right now can't build but also you can get helium three by other processes on Earth without going to the moon I think there's just a really strong desire for there to be some kind of moon economy because it would be awesome I think people queue a lot 
on the age of exploration. Like they have this idea that it'll be like the 1600s or the 1700s when people sail from Europe to India. But the difference is India was this vast, rich place full of people with awesome stuff. And the moon just isn't. Right. It's, yeah. It's It just isn't. It's a big and, rock, like you said. So nonchalant, it's, it's so callously. <laughs> Sorry. It's a cool rock. Um yeah, and then so so people, you know, so, someone out there is saying, okay, shut up about the moon, but the asteroids, there's there's it's whatever, $700 trillion worth of iron or whatever people want to say. And in some sense, that is literally true, right? But you could also say that about like Earth's core, which is made of iron yeah, and Yeah, there's like the 20 is, trillion tons of gold in the core. I made that number up, right. but it's something like that. It's just massive. It's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's, there's more Earth than there is massive asteroids. So almost by definition, there's more value of stuff in the Earth. But the point is, Stuff only has value if it can be got at a profit. Uh, and right now it is extraordinarily expensive. So people have this idea because they watch Star Wars that if you go to an asteroid belt, it's just a wash in these big potato shaped rocks and you need to go get one. Actual asteroids tend to be what are called rubble piles. They're these sort of loose agglomerations of dust and rock. Uh, they're very hard to capture or land on. Also, if you were on one, to the extent you could be on one with, with the microgravity, you wouldn't be able to see another one typically. They're, they're quite sparse uh, on, on the human scale. Um, and so they're just, and, and, and the stuff in them is like regular stuff, okay? There's not like one made of diamonds. The most valuable ones are, these, they have what are called PGM, plat group, platinum group metals. So just imagine there's a high concentration of platinum. And so that sounds very tempting, but there's still low concentration in general. You still have to refine out these rocks to get this platinum. And there's just not that many of these super desirable ones that are relatively gettable and valuable. And so it's, it's just not really a serious industry. Maybe one day if we're like awesome at space and we want to build giant spaceships, it is handy that there's already mass that's outside of Earth's gra gravity pull. But but that's it. Uh, the, the idea that we're going to get rich because of asteroids, I think, is not serious. Yeah, that, that, that always sort of struck me as something that didn't make a ton of sense. But I thought, oh, maybe there's stuff on there that we really can't get. I did some research uh, for an episode on gold, and I just remembered the, the statistic is there's enough gold in Earth's core to coat every bit of land on Earth with a 20 inch thick layer of gold. So you don't need to go anywhere other than the core of the earth for gold. I guess the question is, is it easier to get to the core of the earth and refine that stuff than it is to go to Mars and or to the moon or, or an asteroid? And honestly, I don't have the answer to that. My gut says yes, but I don't have a clue. So it, my guess is not worth anything. The, the other big thing to note there, though, is if we had all that gold, it would not mean we were all rich, right? Because the, the value of gold would go yeah, to nothing, crash. Yeah. right? So, 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 so we use the example of like, so if you go back 200 years, aluminum is really valuable. The tip of the Washington Monument to this day is aluminum because that used to be fancy, right? right? But then industrial processes has made it cheap. And that's great. Like airplanes use aluminum. I'm the, the microphone I'm talking to, I'm sure it uses aluminum. Aluminum is awesome. But it doesn't mean like I have like aluminum foil in my kitchen. It doesn't make me rich. It makes my life better, but it, it doesn't end poverty. Look, like look at you showing off with your aluminum. I have aluminum <laughs> foil in my kitchen. I threw some away yesterday. Yeah, right. I did. This, this freaking guy. Um, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I mean, gold has industrial uses, especially when it comes to space because it doesn't corrode and all that stuff. But you're right. If you if you suddenly have another, let's say, trillion tons, you got five percent of the gold out of the Earth's core, and you have a trillion tons of it. Now it's you're making Coke cans out of gold because it's so exactly. damn cheap. And, and and we're all better off in that world. But the idea that poverty is over or that you can just like take the, the, the raw number, whatever that is worth, the quadrillion dollars and say that like it's as if we got that money. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I'd love to know more about the economics of mining and extracting resources in space, because even if let's say we get a good modular nuclear reactor up there and we, we're ready to build where do we get raw materials and building materials? Do we have to ship them from Earth or are we able to rip stuff out of the ground on Mars or the moon and use that? Is there metal in there? Is there or is it just like, no, you've got to make you got to frickin FedEx this stuff from Alabama like everybody else? Yeah. So so it, if you have to boost it from Earth, that's really bad. Uh, the usual proposals are what's called ISRU in situ resource utilization, just meaning you use local stuff. Um, and there can be, there's a kind of danger here, right? Okay, so the moon has titanium, has magnesium, has uh, silicon, has all sorts of stuff. There was a, a a thing that made a splash recently where some people at Blue Origin, which is Jeff Bezos's rock com uh, rocket company, um, made solar panels 
using this little machine that used, I guess, you know, moon-like uh, soil. The problem is uh, it, it's it's incredibly energy intensive to do a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying it can't be done. It is going to be quite tricky. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, so part of why we're pro Mars, if you are going to do a space settlement, is is that the Mars has everything you need. So as I said a minute ago, moon is carbon poor. Uh, human bodies are about 20% carbon. Plants are, are are generally higher than that. So, and, and for people who don't remember high school physics, you can't just get more carbon. You can't like shape stuff into carbon. Carbon is made in the stars. We You have what you have. Um, so if you have to boost carbon from earth to the moon, you're just, it's not going to work. It's like having to boost a farm rather than ameliorating local soil, right? Whereas whereas Mars has what you what you need. Now, you know, this is, this is, I get frustrated sometimes because people will say there's titanium, therefore we can have titanium structures. But like uh, titanium is really hard to work with that you actually need a whole sort of industrial facility if you're going to make this work, which is, I'm not saying you can't do it on Mars. It's just going to be extremely difficult. Um, and, and you know, we never talk about earth like this. So like the, I'm looking at my backyard, there's absolutely some amount of titanium in the soil here. It doesn't mean I can have I beams made of titanium, right? <laughs> you know, on Earth, when we talk about getting metals, we find places where it's at high concentration, even for something like aluminum. Right. We look for bauxite as a precursor. And then we say, okay, it's going to be mined in West Virginia, shipped off to China for refining. Then it's going to get shipped off to three more countries wrapped in plastic every single time to take advantage of their expertise and economies of scale. And you have to transport all that to another planet, which is not again, not impossible, but just it, we often forget that like the Apple store doesn't make your iPhone. Oh, no, it's, it's such a good point, actually. So very late in writing this book, we were talking to a developmental economist about this. Um, so usually when people talk about the space economy, they talk about resources. And he said, you know, you should see this report from the World Bank, which says 97 and a half percent, I think it was, of all human wealth is not in natural resources. Right. And, and natural resources in the sense of like stuff in the ground, not not things like rainforest or whatever. Right. So about two and a half percent of all of our wealth is that, that kind of stuff. And actually, 90 percent of that is fossil fuels, which don't exist in space. People tend to drastically under uh, I'm sorry, overestimate the importance of minerals, I think, because you go to the gas pump and it like kills you when it's up 50 cents. But actually, like but then you pick up your iPhone, which is made of like, you know, plastic and a little glass. Uh, it is of extraordinary value, and, and you don't think about how cheap it is. But actually, like most of the wealth we have is is those processes you just described, where you have like factories and you have people with ideas and you have these complex processes for making microchips. That's where the money is. Um, uh, you know, the minerals you got to have them because stuff has to be made of stuff. But it's not where most. Of, I feel like this is like one of the most optimistic facts I ever heard. It's like like the real wealth humans have is just coming up with stuff yeah. and making institutions. And that's and actually a things. bonus, right? Because that means because we can right. ship our ideas. That's the e that's one of the easier things to to communicate or move to another place, I guess, if you really think about it. But yeah, it's not quite all the raw it's not quite all the raw material that we actually need to succeed. You mentioned growing food in space and how difficult this is. I guess quantity would be tough. You mentioned the, the biosphere too, people working on the farm six hours a day just to make starvation level rations. What about actual nutrition? Because let's say you're you're managing to grow all these plants and whatnot. You still, were they growing animals there and slaughtering them and getting enough nutrition or was it like they're just existing on soy? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, the truth is, I should say, um, Biosphere 2 probably could have been optimized a lot. So without getting into the details, it was kind of run by these crazy Hippies. Captain Planet types. Yeah. Uh, no, beyond hippies, like sil proto Silicon Valley, kind of zany. Anyway, this is the eighties so when they ran that. Was this the eighties or the nineties? Nineties, but okay. they they're they're part of a group that kind of comes out of the late sixties and early seventies, sort of proto Silicon Valley um, hippie. It sounds stuff. like yeah. some it, what is it? As Asalin, like redwood forest culty types, and they're like, well, let's live yeah, in the biosphere. I, they they were called the synergists. Uh, they lived on a ranch. You can you can look it up. It was it was like that. Yeah, and so. So, yeah, so Biosphere was about three acres. Only about a half of that was what was called, I'm sorry, only about half an acre was what's called intensive agriculture. The rest was like biomes, like they had a ghost 
forest or ghost desert. I don't really know what it is. Uh, they have like a coral reef. Like I said, it's very Captain Planet. So by the end, they were actually moving ag stuff into those zones. So there, there probably was a lot of optimization to do. Um, they did have animals, but they actually had a lot of trouble with animals. So for example, this is a true story. They, uh, they wanted to have pigs. They were going to have potbelly pigs because potbelly pigs are like a small, manageable pig. But then it was like the, that period where potbelly pigs were like everybody's favorite pet. And so they thought the PR would be bad. So oh, they yeah. got this other, yeah, they got this other type of pig. I forget from where that was like a pygmy species, but it was just kind of wild. And I guess it ran around killing stuff. <laughs> um, so they ended up eating them. And so I, I go down the line, they had other problems. Um, at one point, the, the crew, which was an all white crew, and I only mentioned that because uh, they were eating taro. They're growing taro. They didn't know how to process it. So what they're is, like slightly poisoning themselves. Taro is oh, it's a root. Um, oh, taro, uh, the, taro. The, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm saying it oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you're yeah. or you're saying it right, and I say it wrong. <laughs> um, taro, no. Yeah, the, that yeah. like potatoey crap that Taiwanese people love to put in their bubble tea. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. I'm familiar. Purple stuff. Yeah, I do not stuff. like that. For the record, don't give oh. me a tea with taro in it. No thanks. My wife <laughs> yeah, loves it. I'm like you get a little potato and you're drinking drink, yeah. potato. It's no. What are you doing? Way to ruin. <laughs> you can ruin any meal with that. Potatoes included, for that matter. Um, yeah. So, so you, yeah, it's that's funny. Uh, yeah, they, 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 you have to process it a little or it's toxic, right? It's just like a lot of foods. When you get it fresh uh, or raw, it, it needs a little work. They didn't know that. They were all, I think, American and British. And, and, and this was like the 90s before like food was good. And uh, they uh, had to actually call someone. And they, they got connected to a guy like in Puerto Rico who had a recipe. And then it was okay. So there were a lot of kind of like little stupid things. Um so nowadays, if we reran the experiment, probably what you do is have it be almost entirely intensive agriculture, assuming that could support enough oxygen. Um, and then you might not bring any animals. So as a general rule, the bigger the animal, the less it is, the less efficient it is at like converting input to output. So in other words, like to get a whole cow worth of meat takes a huge, huge, if you've ever seen cows grazing, they just all day long mm -hmm. just to get this one cow. It's insane. Whereas if you wanted to survive off crickets, if you could stomach it, uh, it's much more efficient. And so crickets aren't that you bad. Know, we, I've I've eaten many insects, <laughs> you know, in Japan or whatever. They, yeah. It's fine. Um, I wouldn't that, necessarily want it every day. I wouldn't want anything every day. But if I were starving, you could eat cricket. Cr crickets, you know, I, I, you know, if my I had daughter, to choose crickets uh, or taro, yeah. I'm choosing crickets. Uh, that's that is a bold choice. That's th this. That's the thing that's going to piss everyone that, yeah, off. That's, the, uh... that's where the emails coming. <laughs> People are going to start emailing me cricket based foods, and you know what? I'm here for it. Send it to me. I'll send the, you my address. Uh... Yeah, yeah, my 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 daughter when she was four, she tried crickets and she was like, "These are great. The heads are really crunchy." Yeah. And I was like, "I can't, I can't even watch Most you crickets. eating this." I, oh my god! Um, you can eat things like uh, that though. Like I, I when I was in yeah. Cambodia, I said I was hungry, and the girls I was with decided to sort of play, I guess you'd call it a trick. They went and they bought me a big paper bag full of tarantulas, like roasted tarantulas. Go. And you know what? They were good. They were really good. <laughs> I was quite hungry and possibly a little bit drunk, but I ate a whole bag of tarantulas that they probably bought off the roadside, and I God knows where that guy got them, and I didn't get sick. You could live on that kind of stuff. Um, and algae and things like that, I would imagine, would play a large part in ecosystems like this, just because that's so, you almost, here on Earth, you, you grow it by accident. You're trying to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah, actually, algae is an interesting one. Yeah, so there was actually a Soviet Union experiment where they tried to live only off, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a type of algae, I believe, it was called chlorella. And apparently you could you could literally in some sense do this because they have protein and fat and they make oxygen. Huh. But like the people hated it so much they never did it again because <laughs> they're just like nobody wants to live off algae. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th there is something to account for there, which is like you you don't want to optimize too much because eventually the humans are pro are like not happy that you they've been optimized on. But but yeah, actually a, a very typical proposal is to go vegan if people don't want to eat bugs because it's just it's just so much more efficient to grow something like soy uh, than to have animals. But, but I, I do think there's, there's like a reasonable trade off because, you know, I'm, I am a vegetarian. So I'd like, you know, I'm down for this, but like for a lot of people, they, they do want that variety. If you go back to old polar missions, like polar explorations in Antarctica, where they were like up there for years, it's, it's very important to have variety of like flavor and texture for people to be happy. Um, so, so there is a kind of trade off against optimization there. What about humans being able to live in different gravity? You sort of touched on this earlier in the show. How long yeah. has anyone been in space? 
And do we know the if record? Yeah. Do we know if anybody could live longer than that record? Because uh, I assume it's not ten years. It's probably like two years or something, right? It's 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 a it's it's a, it's an open question. Um, so. The longest day ever was by a cosmonaut named Polyakov. He stayed up for 37 consecutive days. I think the record for total days across multiple missions is somewhere in the 800s. Uh, it would have also been done by Soviet cosmonauts. Um, 37 days, that's it? Uh, 437. Oh, 437 yeah, days. Sorry. Okay, I was like, 37 <laughs> yes. days? That doesn't sound like no, that long. No, okay, no. 400. Th that's still, though, in the scheme of things, not that long, right? He was up there for not a year long, yeah. and change. That's a long time yeah. objectively, but if you're like, we're going to go live on Mars and have a family, that's nothing. It's nothing. Uh, uh, so there, there, it's a little complicated. So so that's in what's called microgravity. Just you can think of it as no gravity. Reliably, that does all sorts of bad things to your body. Uh, notably, you lose something like 1% of bone density in your mass, uh, I'm sorry, in your hips per month. Ooh. Uh, very quickly. Uh, and so you also lose muscle strength uh, very quickly. Um, and you have to, right now, astronauts do, I think they do like two, three hours of exercise six days a week just to kind of keep it from getting worse than that. Hmm. But it does get worse. You reliably lose vision. Uh, in space, this is one of the lesser known things about space is that people are actually sent up with with glasses to adjust to the expected vision loss. And that doesn't come back. Uh, it's, it's just a thing that happens in space. Wait, and, you and lose it's, vision it's, in your eye, yeah. in your eyes. Why? You, uh, that we uh, we don't know. Uh, the, the, the thought is um, when you go to space, so your body right is used to pumping blood around and you don't think about it, but like it's hard to pump blood from your feet. It's easier to pump blood near your heart, right? So your body's used to this complex system of pumping blood around this, you know, a person who's, you know, two meters tall pillar of liquid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to space, that confuses your body. If you look at astronauts, they often kind of have baby faces. That's because fluid shifts upward, right? So you they actually call it puffy face. Uh, they also have a term chicken legs, right? So the fluid comes out of your legs. You can lose something like 30% of your, your fluid volume in your legs very quickly. Oh, wow. You actually also end up, astronauts have to pee a lot because your body gets really confused. All of a sudden, there's all this fluid in your upper body. What's going on? Anyway, what that has to do with vision, maybe, I think my understanding is it's still not well understood, but it's possible all that fluid pressure going up is somehow messing with the 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 feeding system for your eyes and it's causing some kind of damage. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, or, or or distortion of the shape, but we, we don't know. What's extra ominous there is there's equivocal evidence, meaning, meaning just like we don't know for sure. There's maybe some evidence that there are negative cognitive effects, like you would lose, like, so to speak, this is a dumb way to say it, but like you lose a couple IQ points for every so often you spend in space. Um, wow. So meaning like if that nerve damage is just in the eyes, that's not great, but okay. But if it's, if it's some sort of overall nerve damage that's really freaky if you start to imagine 10 20 30 years in space right well yeah uh, now now just yeah well ahead. also if if it's damaging our eyes and we know that because our vision gets worse what's it doing to my brain that i have no idea is happening or my liver or other parts of my body where i'm not like hey this is darker and i didn't have that blind spot that that's happening in other areas that you just don't realize right yeah, not only that, but I would add, so I'm giving you a story about the pressure shift, but other stuff that's going on is you're getting a higher rate of doses of radiation. Yeah, let's talk um, about radiation you're, you're, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the, the short version is when, you, when you're sitting down here on Earth, you're protected by the atmosphere from radiation and by the magnetosphere, which is, you know, Earth is a giant magnet, and so it slams these uh, hot ionizing bits of radiation into the poles. And so instead of getting extra radiation, you just get little aurora shows at the poles, which is a pretty sweet deal. Uh, in in um, the International Space Station, you don't have that. You have some protection there from the magnetosphere. Uh, if you go out towards the moon, you don't get that. Um, but so so the basic deal is you are generally getting a higher dose of radiation of types you don't normally get on Earth. And there's also some risk now and then the sun sort of belches out blasts of high intensity radiation. And if you happen to be caught in the beam, you could be in real trouble. You could die of acute radiation sickness, which I would just say is one of the worst ways I can imagine dying. It's very unlikely, but it is it is there. Um, so, yeah, so so there's other stuff. Right. So the atmosphere is also high in carbon. It's fairly different from an Earth atmosphere. So so meaning if, you, if we find cognitive decline, it could be from a variety of stuff. It could even be due to persistent stress or, or combinations of these different things. We don't know. The one thing I wanted to add is a kind of like push back against my own point, though. This is really important. This is all on the International Space Station where you're in microgravity. On the moon, you would be at something like one-sixth Earth gravity. On Mars, it'd be something like 40% Earth gravity. So that might stop or slow down some of the effects, but we just really don't know. 
We talk about radiation against bodies, of course, but what about technology? You know, there's, oh, actually, before we get into the tech, what's this about astronauts? They report seeing flashes that people on Earth can't see. What's going on there? That's kind of scary, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so um, I'm trying to remember, I think the first report from this by an American might have been John Glenn, but don't quote me on it, but basically just seeing, like, these little flashes, and it's thought what's going on is just they're there are parts where you're experiencing these high levels of radiation as you as you zoom around in orbit. So you the, you know persistently hear stories of people even with their eyes closed seeing these flashes, hmm. uh, and it's just like like I mean like we're all we're we're apes we're evolved for the surface down here you know and space is just not gonna behave nicely for us. Wow, so it's almost like remember when back in the day you'd have a cell phone and it would be next to a speaker like a radio in your house and it would go yeah. and you go yeah. my phone's about to ring. That's what this reminds me of. Your eyes are picking up some sort of interference that normally when they're not right next to outside the atmosphere, closer to the sun or whatever, the or supernova, they don't experience this. But now you're outside of that Faraday cage or whatever that we have on Earth and you're picking up all kinds of stuff because the antennas are, des the antennae are designed to p function on Earth, not in space where we would have evolved to, our brain would have just decided we don't see those flashes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's a good way to say it. Yeah. We're evolved for this. That's really, I, somehow that's disturbing that you're getting hit <laughs> by stuff and you can see, I, just, I don't know, that, that's sort of eerie. And there's going to be a lot of that stuff that they're going to discover, I suppose, when they go to space. So back to radiation on bodies and technology, solar flares are, th those things suck on Earth. And I don't, again, I don't know what they are, so maybe explain what they are. But don't they destroy electronics and they can, if we have a big one, it can take the whole grid down and all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, so there, we, 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 we put in a little bit there, the story in, I think, 1859. Um, so you, you sort of imagine the sun just firing off radiation uh, in, in some direction. And fortunately, space is big. So if you're in a spaceship, it just probably doesn't hit you. Uh, but if it does, you're in trouble. And now and then one of these smacks into Earth. So in 1859, there was a really big one. And this is, you have to think like early in the age where people are even thinking about electronics, right? Uh, and so there are these stories of like telegraph stations just suddenly like sparking for no reason. Um, and just problems around the planet with like these electrical surges. And it's it's like not great in 1859. And it would be maybe worse now, but it'd be really scary if you were in a technology dependent habitat on the moon or Mars. And I should say that, you know, the solution to this is almost certainly the same as as we talked about earlier, which is just living underground forever uh, <laughs> instead of in a shining uh, Mars dome. Yeah. How do we shield ourselves from radiation? I, I, there's radiation shielding, I guess. But when I go to the dentist, they put that lead blanket over me. That's probably not something you can build over your entire city and space. Yeah. I mean, you know, of course, in principle, you could. Yeah. So part part of why lead is good is just lead is very dense, right? So it's hard for stuff to get through. Um, but yeah. So, you know, I said, we'll, we'll use dirt. There are kind of, you know, more high tech solutions or these special materials that are especially good at absorbing uh, radiation. If you know anything about nuclear reactors, they often use uh, boron to catch neutrons, which are, you know, bad stuff if, if they smack into you. So you can use, use boron related compounds to absorb radiation. The problem is essentially anytime you're not using local mass, you're having to carry it all the way out of Earth's gravity well or wherever you know, over to where you're going. So ideally, almost all proposals call for just figuring out some way to deal with the local dirt. Uh, um, if, if you're in a spaceship, that's a different question again, right? So if you're, the, the trip to Mars is like six months inbound, six months out, outbound. Um, so I, I think usually what you'd say is for the radiation that's in the background, you're just going to deal with it uh, and probably some increased risk of cancer. Uh, if there's a, a flare, you could have like a panic room, like you could have a like, a small area that was lined with some sort of protective material that, so it wouldn't use up that ma much mass and everyone would, would just sort of run to it <laughs> until the storm was over. It's kind of terrifying, but it's better than... Right, so an air raid siren poison. would go off and instead of grabbing your gas mask, <laughs> if you're an Israeli, you'll know, right? You grab your gas mask. This would be like, oh, we got to go to the radiation room because there's a storm. So everybody's got their little shelter there for, for that and the bathroom and, uh, I don't know, some board games or whatever to pass the time. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe you get very short notice because you, you, there's there's like going to be some preliminaries from the sun before the 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 the, the ions hit you. But I don't think there's a lot of time. Yikes. Um, yeah, that's yeah. not great. That's 
That's not great. I suppose if it doesn't kill you right away, it's just like, ah, I got hit by the last one, but I, and I, I make it to the shelter 70% of the time. I'm, it's, 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 oh, right. God. Yeah. No, but that's the worst thing about radiation poisoning is like, if you get really blasted by radiation, like some guys did in the early days fiddling with uranium and stuff, like you, 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 you know you're going to die a while before it happens Ugh. because your, your tissues are sort of slowly just going to degrade and fall apart. off. But, Ugh, gross. Yeah. Uh, horrible. Tell me about regolith. This is what, space dirt? Yeah. Space dirt. Yeah. So regolith that comes from the root words meaning blanket of rock. So yeah, this is really important. So you look at the surface of the moon and it looks like it's just dust, but it's actually, if you put it under a microscope, it looks a lot of it. it looks like little tiny knives, uh, which is not, not what happens when you do that on earth. And the difference is that you remember that the, the moon doesn't have weather, right? It doesn't have running water. It doesn't have life or anything. So the surface is just kind of naked to stuff. So if, uh, you imagine like a, a heavy rock from space smashes the surface, heats it, fuses it then uh, another one comes later does the same thing but now it shatters that does this over and over and over and over and there's also radiation uh pelting all this stuff and you imagine this just going on for eons and eons and eons so it's much more like shattered glass and rock than it is just like sand on the beach and the the result of that is is a couple things so the astronauts from the apollo program landed they described it almost like it was alive because it was static charged and very clingy right um so we get up in equipment uh, and when people breathed it in, I remember, I think Harrison Schmidt, who was on Apollo 17, said it was like he had an allergic reaction to it. The concern, and we don't, we just don't know, but the concern is that if you breathe this stuff long enough, you might get something similar to what's called stone grinder's disease, which uh, you can imagine how that comes about. Uh, but the result of it is uh, intense lung scarification over time means that it basically becomes very hard to breathe, very energy intensive just to breathe. It's very bad, very awful disease to get. And so it's possible exposure to regolith is going to do that to you. Uh, you, can, you can also imagine what effects it might have on equipment. Uh, part of the problem is, we, you know, people, the grand total of time that people spent walking around the moon is something like two weeks, right? You know, we, we, we did it all in a very brief period, not for very long. So we really don't know much about long-term medical effects of this stuff, but it, it's probably something you do not want to interact with. It sounds like it could get all goopy and possibly get into machinery and things like, I mean, like sand does that too. This sounds almost worse because it's not smoothed out by weather and atmosphere. And I guess if stuff also cakes on, it starts to insulate, which may or may not be a good thing. I mean, we're talking about using it as an insulator for radiation here, but there's other cases where you don't want that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So part of why spacesuits are white uh, is because that's to reflect heat, right? Um, j just like when it's summer and you're told to wear your like white shirt, uh, uh, that's the same reason. And so, whereas regolith is this kind of plastery gray color. So if it gets caked on all over the suit, you can get heating problems and that's dangerous. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a story, I forget which Apollo mission it was, but they landed and they actually picked up a robotic probe that had been sent years earlier. It was called Surveyor, I think it's Surveyor 3. And they said it looked like it had been sandblasted. Now, in fairness, that's probably because their rocket shot a lot of the regolith at it. But still, it's like that's that's what this stuff does, right? Uh, it's 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 not it's like it's like gritty sand. Uh, and it's 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 probably quite dangerous. And the, and the basic upshot of this is it's just going to be a huge problem all the time, and how it'll have to be dealt with. All right, now my family's here for the holidays, which makes me wonder just how many humans do we need in a population before we have no risk of inbreeding? Ah, <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> didn't did think that was the direction that no. was uh, going. Um, so, I'm sure you didn't. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is this is an old question. Um, so, it actually questions like this usually come up in conservation biology, right? So, when there's like there's four and a half of this species of rhinos left, can we save them? And the usual answer is, if it's that low, the answer is no. Uh, a, a general rule of thumb, and it's very rule of thumby among conservation biologists, is about 500 is, is how many you need. It can get a little complicated uh, because, you know, it depends on how related those 500 are and and, and a bunch of other factors. But the, the very short version of this is there have been a lot of models built by space geeks mostly to see, like, well, what would be the minimum number of humans we would need so that if we never had any more immigration, we'd have a shot at not eventually succumbing to inbreeding. And the lowest number we found was 98. The more typical numbers are in the, like, 5,000 to, like, 30,000 range. And I should say 98 was not, not a joke, but like it was a it was a science project, which was like, what is the absolute minimum? And it depended on essentially like a computer telling everybody who to mate with and how many kids to have right. preserved genetic. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we 
you know, it also assumes nothing ever goes wrong, uh, which is, you know, yeah, probably right. not That's a, a good great point. assumption. <laughs> you have to have some small amount of immigration or just genetic engineering to the point where they can be like, all right, normally this would cause a problem, but we're going in and we're going over your DNA with a fine tooth comb and we're putting this test tube baby together for you. It's going to have to be yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so you can get into these sci-fi solutions. So there's another solution, which is you could freeze dry male gametes. I mean, like men are basically worthless. You just <laughs> send all only women and uh, supply like a library of male gametes. And uh, then you could introduce genetic diversity that way. The basic downside being like you have to enforce this, which, you know, gets dystopian very quickly. Right. So I don't know. There, there are a lot of sort of gadget solutions to genetic diversity. I think they're probably bad ideas because, you know, you're trying to convince your kids like you should obey the computer's mating selection algorithm. That's going to be a tough conversation. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. You thought Romeo and Juliet was rough. <laughs> Wait, are the AIs <laughs> telling you who you can mate with? I mean, I guess it would almost be like the you're, you pick your partner based on who you want, but then you just don't actually... What is it? Was that movie Demolition Man? It, like you don't actually do any real mating at all. Everyone's st sterilized or whatever, and you just make babies in test tubes only for that. That's that is dystopian. That's like that's pretty, that's pretty out there. All right, I know we're running out of time. Is it legal for Elon Musk or the United States or China to colonize space in the first place? I know space law is a thing. And space is space a commons? I don't even know if that's the case or not. Right. So, so the 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 short version is there's a document called the Outer Space Treaty. All the big powers have agreed to it since 1967. It says you countries cannot claim chunks of space. It's very clear. Article two says it in plain language. You cannot claim chunks of space. The U.S. contra what Newt Gingrich proposed once cannot claim the moon as a state. <laughs> that would be an assertion of national sovereignty over the moon, which you can't do. Elon Musk can't, nor, nor can Elon Musk independently say, I'm not part of Earth. I'm my own state on the moon. That would still violate international law. You might say that's fine because he's Elon Musk and he's allowed to do what he wants. I think that's pretty questionable, but whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it is absolutely against the rules. Space is supposed to be regulated as a commons. People people sometimes debate exactly what that means, but it at least means that you, there are no national territories, right? So China cannot claim a chunk of the moon is China. They could set up a base and they can even be fairly exclusive about it, but they cannot literally claim sovereignty over it. The other issue here is space law, much like international law, it's just not really super enforceable outside of what you would, I guess, Earth-based conflict, right? And, and add to it that space powers are nuclear powers, generally, I think without exception, now that I think about it, we risk nuclear conflict on Earth or, yeah, well, nuclear conflict on Earth if we try to compete for space resources. So if 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 China goes and says, you know, this, we, we rescind our acceptance of this treaty or we're doing this, but it doesn't count, it's we get a loophole, the U.S. is going to go, OK, fine. Well, we're blockading your Navy on Earth because, no, right. we disagree. Yeah. The, the, the way I think about it, so people will sometimes say, you know, international law is not like domestic law because there's no, you know, there's no police who are going to, like, put you in country jail mm -hmm. when you are a bad country. Right. Um, that's true. One way you could think of it is sort of like gang warfare. Right. So, like, uh, you know, gangs, you know, there, there is no overarching law because they're, they're outside the law. They still have conventions between each other. And there are still behaviors that are not done. And that, you know, obviously has a lot to do with power, but it's still real. It doesn't disappear because you've identified that it's just the powerful nations enforcing their views, right? So the international law that governs uh, space is generally agreed upon by the most powerful countries. And I think the thing to realize here is suppose Elon Musk did start his own city on Mars tomorrow and claimed it was independent of Earth. Um, it's not just that that would violate the international law. It would probably it would probably anger, say, China and Russia a lot more than it would anger Western powers. I think Western powers would still be frustrated. Uh, but but the idea of setting up a liberal West aligned nation on, on Mars, assuming that's what Elon Musk would want to do, would, would obviously be more offensive to certain parts of the planet than others. So the geopolitics would be more complicated than a kind of Mars law versus Earth law situation. So what is the best plan in your mind for colonizing something in space. Do we wait for more scientific leaps and then send people? And if so, what leaps are we waiting for? Nuclear fusion or what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we argue for what we call a wait and go big approach, which is wait because there is a lot of science that needs to be done. We don't know enough about human reproduction to do this ethically. We don't know how to build these complex ecosystems. We really, we still need to scale the rockets quite a bit. 
Uh, but really, we need that basic science of reproduction that's going to take at least decades if someone started spending on it now, which they are not. <laughs> um, and we also, I think you could make a good argument that we need, need need better legal structures. We could argue all day long about what that should be, but something that that is less conducive to war than the system we have now. Um, and then two, you'd want to go big, and that obviously requires a lot of technology, but there there's so many advantages to going big, uh, just to going to scale. Like, like we, 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 did, we, we might have touched on this, but we have a chapter about the idea of space psychology. Uh, and, and the short version is, you know, there's, there's no evidence contrary to what people sometimes say that people go mad in space, but they do have regular psychiatric issues like anywhere else. And so we need a big enough settlement that you can have regular division of labor um, to take care of all these problems. Uh, you know, we talk about some of the economics that are also helped by just scale. Um, probably it's the case that with the ecosystem design, it gets easier at scale. Right. Uh, making an ecosystem functional at the size of a thimble is, is probably harder than uh, the size of a city. Um, so so if you can wait long enough to take this big approach, I think a whole lot of different problems get solved. And there's also just time to work out, um, you know, a lot of the really freaky stuff uh, ethically, because if, if we if you have a world where because of all the medical problems we discussed, there's a higher than normal rate of birth abnormality. But you're also in a world where everyone's considered to have to pull their own weight. Um, that's a that's like a potential nightmare scenario. Right. right. Yeah, and you so, end up with so there's, yeah. some pretty horrible ideas on how, what to do about that, right? Yeah, I I think so. And 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 often people are surprisingly cool with it. And it's just like this is a choice. Let's not make this choice. Uh, you know, let's let's wait until we can do it in a way that doesn't like create an evil space empire. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> uh, it, I, I've had this conversation with people where it's just like, they'll be like, yeah, it's, it's probably going to be a lot more authoritarian and dangerous uh, on Mars. Like, why are we building an evil enemy right. on Mars? But, like completely uh, incompatible, not just with American values, but with Earth values. Yeah, just basic human right. decency stuff. Like, yeah. oh, when, you, when right. you have a child that's not born strong enough to withstand the environment and the pressure, you don't just murder them as a child and feed them to the rest of the team for protein like no we we don't do that oh well we're gonna have a problem here like you thought yeah. you think north korea is bad it's it's gonna make that place look like disneyland so okay it sounds like you think we should hold off for now what is the timeline on a lot of this science you mentioned decades and that's if people are spending now which they aren't so are we talking about like a hundred plus years from now that, that that would be my guess. I mean, I always want to say you mentioned like nuclear fusion. You know, there is some world in which uh, next week we have advanced AI and it uh, showers us with insights and everything changes. But with, with what I see now, especially given that some of these problems are biological uh, and, and have to do with human medicine, which means we have to go slow. Uh, I, I think at least decades, if if not centuries, is the timelines we should be thinking about uh, for, for settlement. I mean, if you're talking about putting a cool base. On, on the moon, that can be done in 10 years. I don't know if it will be, but the technology is there. But but trying to have families, generations, like having to really settle and make a new life for humanity somewhere else, that's centuries. Zach, thank you so much. By the way, what we're going to get emails about is people going, there already is a base on Mars. You're just not talking <laughs> about that. it. That's what we're going to oh, get God. emails about. It, it's slid in right at the end of the show. That's where the, that's where the kooks are going to come from, let me tell you. Zach, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate you doing the show. This is fascinating stuff. There's no getting around it. Really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com, where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns. To find out if they're back by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.